Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined our webinar today. We are extremely pleased to be releasing the UK India Business Council's sixth annual report on doing business in India, the UK perspective. In today's session, our group CEO, Jayant Krishna, will present key findings from our report, which illustrates the views of UK businesses and higher education institutions on India's business environment and the ease of doing business. We are joined today by our guest, Mr. Shailendra Singh, who is Additional Secretary at the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, Nandita Sagal Tali, who is Managing Director at the Thomas Lloyd Group, and Louise Donahue, who is Senior Vice President of Defence for India and South Asia at Rolls-Royce. They will join our panel discussion today, which will be moderated by Parichit Luthera from CNBC TV 18. Before we begin the session, I'd like to remind our viewers that they have automatically been placed on mute. You will, however, be able to type your questions and comments into the control panel, and we'll take these up during the Q&A. Thank you very much, and without further ado, I'd now like to hand over to our group CEO, Jayant Krishna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dexa. Uh, I hope I'm clearly audible. Yes, you are. Yeah, so next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, basically, you know, the sixth report in a row uh, uh, for last uh, five to six years. UK India Business Council has been doing this survey. The idea is to gauge the mood and reaction of uh, UK businesses, both large corporates as well as uh, SMEs who operate uh, out of India. And uh, this year uh, we saw some record participation. Uh, you know, we had in-depth uh, survey feedback and interviews with as many as 106 uh, uh british businesses uh, spanning the manufacturing service sector uh you know obviously large corporates uh, smes uh, you know all, all and even some institutions of higher uh, education uh, so i think uh, uh, uh the, the very very interesting findings you know we had in the in the report uh, this year and uh, as you know india's uh, rank uh, on ease of doing business has been improving consistent consistently in the last uh, several years last year the rank was uh, 63rd and uh, you know uh, we at uk india business council you know uh, you know our endeavor would be you know to keep uh, suggesting more and more reforms uh, not only just waiting for the annual report but we keep doing it as a part of our advocacy measures uh, every now and then we'll keep doing that and uh, i would believe that uh, very soon india would be in the top 50 and and the eventual position for india uh, for a country of india's size and uh, uh, size of our economy, I think we have to be there in the top 25 in, in foreseeable future. So that is that is the, the uh, mandate uh, with which you know we are working. Uh, uh, so next slide, uh, please. So a quick uh, look uh, into you know what what makes the Indian market uh, attractive and 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 the five more uh, pull factors you know that UK businesses have considered. Uh, you know, while doing a business with India. The first one may sound strange to you, uh, but actually a physical visit by the British business, by the UK business to India uh, to take stock of the situation, assess the market and, and, and ascertain what kind of potential that they have, the size of the market, the purchasing power and so on and so forth. That was surprisingly a very, very big reason, you know, why they started doing with uh, business uh, in India. The second uh, uh, issue was, uh, you know, there was a request from uh, customers uh, for a product or service. Uh, they were they were consumers in 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 India, and they they wanted uh, UK companies to set up uh, businesses there, firms there for manufacturing or service sector or whatever. And third, of course, no brainer, you know, size of the Indian consumer market, uh, uh, it being the second largest anywhere in the world, and it's a market which uh, no other uh, company can afford to uh, neglect uh, altogether. The fourth reason uh, that uh, the report uh, found was. The availability of uh, uh, technical staff, managerial staff, skilled uh, people, uh, you know, now, I mean, this is like a double-edged sword. Sometimes you also keep cribbing, you know, that these resources are not good enough. You know, there is a, there's a gap in their skilling. But the fact is, you know, we have the numbers and as people are getting more educated and more uh, skilled, at least in the vocational uh, uh, sense, you know, they, they are moving up the value chain and perhaps helping the country uh, to reap uh, the demographic dividend in some form or the other. And, and last but not the least, you know, awareness of uh, uh, the action of competitors in Indian market. If some of their competitors of the British businesses, they were already operating or they, they were present in the Indian uh, market or in the Indian uh, space, you know, that was another reason why they did that business. So next, please. So uh, this is a quick uh, uh, indication of, you know, the, the darker the shade of the blue color that you see. That's the, the those are the uh, states where you have the maximum footprint of the uh, UK businesses uh, in India, 
and uh, Maharashtra tops the list uh, very, very clearly. Uh, and, and, and we also found out this time uh, that, you know, which are the states, you know, where you have, they have seen the maximum incremental improvement in the last uh, few years. And Maharashtra again uh, tops the chart, followed by Karnataka, Delhi, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Chandigarh, and Haryana. And, and the five topmost reasons what uh, British businesses consider while taking their location decision uh, of their manufacturing or service sector operations in India uh, are in this order. Uh, you know, how, how effective is the bureaucracy, how quick, uh, you know, the state level approval uh, cycle works, the government cycle works. Of course, second being the size of the market. Uh, and third is the quality of physical infrastructure available uh, in, 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 in that state. That's a big reason. And of course, proximity to the customers and especially uh, uh, both for industrial products as well as uh, consumer products, you know, how close would their operation be to their end users, you know, and, and uh, uh, last uh, though not the least, of course, there are more factors, but you know, here we are only presenting the top five. The fifth one was uh, the digital, the quality of digital infrastructure that the states could uh, uh, boast of. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so just see how within a few years, physical infrastructure and digital digital infrastructure, you know, these both have physical was always there, but how the quality of digital infrastructure has become in the top five reasons uh, why businesses decide to locate in a particular state. You know, uh, next slide, please. So this is a quick assessment of, uh, you know, a rating of uh, India's uh, business environment. Uh, you know, the top five uh, rated components of the Indian business environment and the right hand side, it shows the, the, the negative ones, you know, the, the, uh, where we, there's a lot of scope for improvement. Of course, telecom, uh, uh, you know, availability of support services uh, and, and service providers, uh, skilled labor, uh, availability, especially from a manufacturing standpoint, available, availability of the supply chain and uh, ease of uh, getting uh, power connection and power availability. Now, this is a surprising thing because till a few years back, you know, people used to crib about uh, the pathetic power situation in the country. And if it, that becomes among the top five reasons why, uh, you know, uh, of, of the Indian business component, uh, it surely shows that there has been a lot of improvement on the power availability and, and, and the mechanism of getting a connection uh, for, for business in India. And, and, and the negative uh, areas where a lot of improvement is required is, of course, uh, efficiency and effectiveness of the government uh, processes. Uh, uh, these have improved over a period of time, but there's a long, long, long way to go. Uh, the second uh, factor is regulatory uh, uh, certainty, uh, uh, you know, is not there to an extent it, it, it should be there uh, in terms of predictability of uh, tax regime, uh, issues like retrospective tax and so on and so forth, uh, uh, GST processes and changing rates. Uh, environmental regulations are also uh, an area which needs to improve. The quality of regulations and ease of certification, uh, that's uh, very, very important, especially from, from, a, from a trade and uh, you know, uh, import-export perspective. And of course, uh, ease of closing, uh, closing down the business. I mean, despite the fact that we have the Bankruptcy and uh, Insolvency Act in place now, but still it is not that seamless for a business that has failed or uh, you know, it is it has well past the technology curve or for whatever reason, if the business wants to wind up, despite the code which was enacted, uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, you know, it is it is not that seamless. It, it remains difficult to close down business. Next, so these are the barriers to do uh, business uh, very clearly. Uh, legal and regulatory uh, issues have emerged as the topmost barrier, uh, and we knew this has been happening for the last few years. This year was no exception, and so therefore we decided to drill down more. That you know, what are these regulatory uh, and legal barriers? You know, which. Uh, uh, impede uh, prospects of uh, soliciting more investments uh, in India. Second is price points. You know, our guess is uh, this is largely because of the pressure on margins induced by the pandemic, uh, which because of which the businesses are uh, concerned. And third, of course, is the taxation issues, both uh, GST, more of a GST process issue. And of course, you know, the retrospective tax, uh, which I uh, mentioned, and there are a whole lot of other things as well. Uh, the last three factors that you see are scaled at the same level, so we can't call them four, five, and six. They're perhaps all at the fourth level, uh, cumbersome government approval system, uh, corruption, uh, speed money, uh, and of course, finding a suitable business partner for those companies you know, who do not want to come directly and operate through a joint venture or a local business partner. Uh, next, please. So, uh, as I said, uh, you know, since regulatory barriers were coming out to be topmost, we, we decided to uh, dig uh, a bit deeper into those uh, areas and we found uh, that uh, 
The foreign exchange regulations are perhaps uh, remain uh, one of the big uh, pain areas within the overall regulatory uh, umbrella, uh, followed by GST. And uh, GST is not as much a rate issue as as, as the process issue, uh, you know, and a lot of changes which have happened over a period of time. Import tariffs, a lot of people who have uh, UK businesses who export to uh, India, they feel uh, for many product categories, you know, the uh, import duty, the custom duty is still uh, prohibitive, you know. And of course, alignment with international standards that Indian businesses need to align with the with with the, with the time time tested international uh, standards rather than keep insisting on on their own standards that emerged as as one of the uh, top six regulatory barriers. Uh, incorporation of the company, you know, despite some uh, under ease of doing business, some improvement having happened, still feel peer uh, businesses feel that in other countries it is much faster to incorporate a new company uh, as compared to India. And and uh, the sixth factor being the judicial processes should. Uh, there be a litigation that my company enters into you know what is how cumbersome the, those the, those procedures are and uh, you know uh, what is the resolution time uh, it would take you know so these kind of things uh, continue to be a, a problem area uh, the next uh, uh, slide uh, please and here we talk about you know the the reforms which have been rated as the top five uh, reforms or improvements uh, you know they some of them may not be full blown blown reforms but surely big time improvements the top five which the British businesses have uh, asked for. Uh, the topmost that, that they said that the bureaucracy needs to be more accountable. The processes need to be much, uh, uh, there should be a lot of streamlining in the processes. Uh, and, and second again is the, reg no wonder since the regulatory issues came up there as a, as a big barrier. So therefore the second biggest factor here is increasing regulatory certainty into the country. Uh, simplification of uh, GST processes being the next and uh, followed by uh, you know improving the quality of infrastructure. Of course, things are much better on the ground now, but still vis-a-vis uh, -vis international standards, there's a long way to go. And last, uh, you know, out of the top five is the uh, lack of efficacy of the single window clearance. You know, there are a lot of states and for uh, since uh, quite some time, they offer the single window clearance system, uh, one window uh, clearance system. But uh, you know how effective that system is, that, that remains uh, an issue. Uh, because uh, uh, some businesses, businesses do feel that the single authority that the states create, which has to take the decision, a go or no go decision on behalf of multiple uh, entities, government entities in the state, perhaps they lack the teeth to take that decision. Some states tried this with the Industries Facilitation Act uh, with some success. Some have modified those acts. But I think uh, the efficacy and the effectiveness of the single window clearance clearly needs uh, uh, you know, a huge improvement. There is, there is no doubt about that, uh, which came, uh, which has uh, become, which emerged loud and clear. So next, uh, if you look at, these are uh, very clearly sectoral, you know, the top barriers and top reforms we talked about uh, overall. So I'll not uh, spend too much of, uh, next slide, please. So I'll not talk about a uh, uh, lot of detail here, but, uh, you know, some of the issues, uh, uh, for example, advanced engineering and manufacturing it talks about uh, it's a very very price sensitive market that's what they say and therefore price points are very very uh, touchy uh, 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 ICT business you know especially software exports and uh, ITS exports uh, it uh, uses foreign currency very substantially and therefore uh, international ra exchange rates and uh, India still not being a strong currency and the fluctuation in the exchange rates I think those have been highlighted as a top barrier uh, and uh, I'll not go into everything in food and drinks for example this is a big issue because there are a lot of uh, food and uh, beverage uh, UK companies that operate in India and they feel that sometimes it is very difficult to do business uh, in India as uh, you know they have to uh, knock the doors of different states where there's a lot of regulatory changes, uh, like regulatory variations across the states and, and sometimes they feel it is like doing business with multiple countries you know as doing business with multiple states in our country. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll not spend more time on this slide. Next please. So this uh, clearly, this is an interesting uh, slide, you know, on Brexit, uh, we try to track that, uh, you know, the final date for Brexit, you know, where uh, things will be different uh, from 31st January 2020 uh, for UK as, as uh, uh, you know, it breaks away from the European Union. Uh, we wanted to see how will it impact the businesses of UK companies in India. And uh, you'll be surprised, uh, almost 31% uh, uh, of those companies when we interviewed, they said they will do more business. Post-Brexit, they will do more business with India. And 69% of them said it makes no difference at all. At all. So it's a status quo. Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, the, uh, their business with India would not be impacted at all. And there was not even one company which said that Brexit would uh, make an adverse impact on the business that they, uh, that they do in India. That's very, very encouraging. Uh, so Brexit, uh, uh, in, in an indirect manner, perhaps it's, it's a good news uh, for those British companies which are doing uh, business in India and for India as well. Uh, COVID uh, is the other thing uh, that we wanted to raise. Uh, while 35% uh, of the companies we interviewed, uh, they said that uh, it would, uh, you know, they would perhaps do less business uh, in India. And le less business is largely because the economy's overall size has shrunk. So if that is the case, you know, the business that they do with India would also uh, shrink. But what is heartening is 43% companies said that it doesn't impact at all. And 22% companies said that they'll do more business in India. You know, you have the story of, uh, uh, you know, uh, AstraZeneca uh, and Oxford vaccine, but getting manufactured in the in the Serum uh, uh, Institute in uh, India, and and so many other things. You know, so I, actually, uh, if you add 22 and 43, it means almost two thirds of the companies uh, say that uh, COVID will either not impact their business or they will do more business with India. And and the last slide that I have uh, as as my presentation is uh, next, please, is about uh, the. Self-reliant India, the Atmanirbhar Bharat, because initially when it was launched, there was an apprehension in, in at least some of the British businesses that would it lead to more protectionism and uh, would uh, it lead to a situation where India will be isolated, uh, uh, you know, from the rest of the world. But, you know, a lot of clarifications came from the prime minister, from the finance minister that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Atmanirbhar Bharat, the self-reliant India does not mean isolation. If at all, it means it means a greater uh, integration of Indian uh, business with the with the global economy, and no wonder, you know, 77% uh, of all companies that we surveyed, they said they see Atmanirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India as a huge opportunity for them, opportunity to engage more, to co-create, to uh, co-develop. Uh, you know, some of our uh, uh, members like Rolls Royce, they are even talking about co-creating, uh, uh, you know, an aircraft engine, co-developing in India. And a whole lot of examples, uh, you know, are, are, are there. And, uh, and, and of course, leveraging the idea is you leverage the technical know-how and the R&D and the innovation that happens uh, uh, in UK uh, and uh, leverage that uh, for manufacturing in India. So actually, that's, that's a wonderful feedback that uh, rather than uh, seeing it as a threat, they see it as an opportunity. Uh, you know, almost uh, more than three-fourths of the businesses said that it's an opportunity. So I'll I'll uh, end uh, you know my presentation at uh, that level uh, you know and uh, uh, so uh, I was just trying to figure out has Mr. Shailendra Singh, uh, the additional secretary, uh, DPIIT, has he joined the meeting as yet? He is here. We're just waiting for him to connect, Jay, and it should be just a minute. So, all right. So should we wait or should we uh, start? Uh, I think we can start. I think he will be making comments. All right. So what we'll do, uh, you know, uh, he would uh, join, uh, you know, the panel discussion as and when he comes and uh, his address will schedule towards the end, uh, respecting everybody's time. And uh, so uh, over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Parikshit Lutra. He's one of the best known uh, faces and one of the most uh, celebrated uh, television journalists uh, in India on the CNBC TV 18 channel. Uh, so we couldn't have found a better person to to uh, to host uh, this panel discussion. So over to you, Parikshit. Parikshit, you are muted. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mr. Krishna. And uh, it's an interesting report with several key takeaways. Important at a time when we're living in a post post pandemic world, uh, especially at a time when uh, the government is pushing the Atma Nirbhar. Bharat campaign and also there is a lot of focus on self-reliance. So this report says that 66% of respondents say that it's easier to do business in India and I think year after year legal and regulatory barriers are something that most businesses are talking about. I'd like to introduce our panelists over here. We've got uh, Nanta Segal of the Thomas Lloyd Group, Louis Donahue of Rolls-Royce and Mr. Jain Krishna also joining us. Mr. Krishna, if I can uh, begin with you, we have a large number of respondents saying that it is easier to do business in India. But uh, give us a sense of how working in India, opening businesses in India, functioning here has improved over the years. 
Uh, see, Parikshit, you know, as uh, evidenced by our improved ranking on the ease of doing business, uh, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, you know, international agencies which do that uh, study. I think uh, from 140th something and in 41 or 42 to 63 is no no mean, uh, 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 you know, that's 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 no mean task at all. It's it's, it's a major uh, shift. Uh, so I would uh, my personal feel on this is that. Uh, you know, government has leveraged technology big time for online approvals and things like that. Uh, a lot of e-governance has been used uh, for business sanctions and approvals. So th that is one area where a lot of lot of uh, improvement has happened. Uh, but at the same time, you know, where the human interface of business with uh, people in the government, uh, uh, you know, is, is concerned, that's one area where a lot more improvement needs to happen. I was there in a round table with the uh, uh, with the UK's uh, Minister for Investment uh, just before this, and you'll be surprised the comment that he made. He said uh, that I see greater hunger and, and the velocity of changes and velocity of decision making in India is perhaps faster than what you see in UK. That, that's, a, that's a comment that came from uh, the UK's uh, minister. Mm. Right. So uh, I, think, but... I think things are improving. Where they, we have come this far, but there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go. Uh, Nanta Segal, would you like to elaborate on some of the uh, challenges that your company may be facing in India, how it could, how the government can possibly intervene to make things easier for businesses? Sure, thank you. Um, so we are an asset manager, we're an investor. We made an investment into India in 2018. And I think um, during that process, we found um, certain um, aspects of entering into the country and making our investment uh, much easier than we had uh, thought they would be. And we found certain aspects very challenging. Um, just to add to what uh, Mr. Krishna is saying, that um, certain amount of things have become uh, online approvals and certain amount of approval process have been online. And for, for a business like us who were entering into India for the first time, um, that, uh, that helped. But we, um, similarly to a lot of the respondents of this survey, found that the regulatory aspect of, um, of doing business um, was not difficult, it just took time. So whilst we had planned a certain time horizon to enter into the country and make our investment, perhaps mm -hmm. a six month period and a seven month period it took almost a year and i and that's what i would urge people to say is whatever you um you, you need to be patient and add that time along uh, that timeline um, you know a, a, an extended timeline when you are dealing with regulatory approvals right uh, let me, uh, get you in over here uh, especially because rolls royce is into defense and aerospace uh, there have been a number of reforms in the defense sector. Uh, the government has been focusing a lot on self-reliance, empowering small and medium enterprises in the defense sector. They've recently hiked the FDI limit as well. Uh, are these things making, uh, are, do, you, do you see these reforms as attractive for uh, companies? Yes, is the short answer. So Rolls-Royce has quite a different story in India. Um, We've been in India for 85 years now, and in fact, we've been making in India in the defence sector for more than 60 years. Um, but I would say that in recent years, the reforms are extremely positive in the defence sector. Um, and certainly, I would say the time for the UK to partner with India is now. Um, and that's something that Rolls-Royce is very keen uh, to capitalise on. My most mm. important lesson in doing business with India um, is partnership. It's all about collaboration. And we've been really fortunate um, in our 60 plus years to have a strong partner in, in HAL, in Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. We've got a couple of joint ventures, um, both in our power systems business unit and also our defense business unit. We also have a joint venture in IAMPL with HAL who manufacture components for our civil aerospace business. So I think if I look as to where we've succeeded historically, it's been through partnership and collaboration. But I think the key thing that you're seeing in the reforms that you've just highlighted are actually let's change the game. Let, let's move from making in India, because if we're truly candid, that's a small part of the value chain. I think mm -hmm. if I look at the government's mission in terms of self-reliance, particularly in defense, there's real value now in co-creation and co-development 
rather than just a manufacture under license, which is the model that Rolls-Royce has operated in the defence sector to date. There's much more opportunity and value now in leveraging the capability and talent to actually co-develop new technology, not just for India, but in partnership with the UK for the world. So I see the reforms very, very positively in, in short. Right. Uh, Nanita, just taking a cue from what Louis was pointing out, when it comes to Atmanirbha Bharat, and this report has welcomed it, but do you feel that some UK companies may find a certain contradiction in this on one hand when we say that we're open to business uh, at the same time saying that we will focus on self-reliance so do you see a convergence or a contradiction in interests here no i see uh, i i i don't see a, a contradiction i would absolutely agree with louise that that um that uh, it's only a small part of the the value chain to say that um, make in India is is uh, it can be done in only certain aspects. In our own field of um, energy and renewable energy, the government very much um, uh, has has put out very ambitious targets in, in the level of renewable energy, solar and wind that it would like to install um, by 2022. Um, this capacity um, to make uh, the energy transition of the of the country into renewables um, over a period of time uh, cannot be done only by Make in India. It has to be done through collaborations, into co-creations, into by partnerships, and and um, uh, and easing that supply chain for for that uh, to be able to happen. Right. Uh, Mr. Krishna, just to get you in over here, uh, among the regulatory hurdles, would you say that probably there needs to be more predictability in uh, in the tax structure? Uh, recently, we have been seeing a lot of quality control orders. Uh, yes, there is a lot of focus on localization, but uh, do you feel that some of these measures that are being taken, there were delays at customs ports recently, all of them are uh, disruptions for businesses and uh, and, and probably those need to be ironed out. Yeah, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, I think these, these are disruptions. You know, they they uh, tend to uh, make the investor uh, sentiments go weak uh, because any business that invests in India, uh, or for that matter, in any other country, they want to see continuity of uh, uh, legal issues, of regulation, of tax structures. That's very, very clear. You know, because when you make a decision to invest in a country on a certain premise, you, you do expect a, a slight tinkering with the laws, with the regulation, with the tax structure here now and then. But any major changes which are introduced for which they had not bargained for when they had taken the investment decision, those definitely uh, dampen the, the investor spirit. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure the government is mindful of that. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're, and, 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 but let me give you another good feedback. The number of people who have rated regulatory issues as the top uh, challenge or regulatory uncertainty is a top challenge. It has been going down. It is still the number one challenge, but the percentage of people uh, who have voted for it has been going down uh, year after year. So, uh, as I said again, uh, you know, it's 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 a glass. Uh, you know, whether you see it as a half full or uh, half empty, uh, you know, a lot of things have happened. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes if you look at India, uh, as if uh, you get a feeling that it's it's a, you know as if there are a million mutinies happen all the time, and uh, you know there are lots of things, changes happening, a country in the making and uh, and uh, experimentation with newer things uh, also uh, very often uh, you know to 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 uh, find better uh, better ways of uh, doing business but but clearly yes uh, uh, businesses do expect uh, uh, you know a certainty of regulation over a period of time that because the regulation at the end of the day is not that nothing can change because it's all about uh, fairness equity uh, and 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 righteousness you know so that that becomes very very uh, paramount uh, when any uh, not just the UK but businesses from anywhere if they if, if they want to come and invest in India. Right, you know, Mr. Uh, Krishna, I'd also like to ask you about areas where there has been improvement in the ease of doing business. And you're saying that Maharashtra comes out as a state with maximum incre incremental improvement. Why is that, and how does Maharashtra score over other states? See, Maharashtra uh, has been a top scorer even earlier. This is not the first time, you know, that they have uh, become. Uh, another reason uh, that you uh, uh, could be that there is a critical mass of British businesses in Maharashtra. So, you know, their their, their footprint in Maharashtra is the maximum vis-a-vis -vis other uh, states, you know. And 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 
whatever you may say, Maharashtra has always been the uh, you know more industry savvy uh, state. Has been uh, Bombay has been the business capital of the country, and uh, you know it. Maharashtra contributes the single largest component uh, any state contributes to the country's uh, GDP. So Maharashtra has always uh, had a, a slightly better ease of doing business. And, and, and because there is already a critical mass of uh, businesses, uh, British businesses in India, uh, therefore, you know, it has got translated into this uh, outcome that, yes, incrementally, they have improved uh, more with the other states. Right. Uh, Mr. Shailendra Singh of the DPIIT is here, I believe. Uh, Mr. Singh, thank you so much for joining us here on this discussion. I hope you can hear us. Yes, I can. And sorry for the delay. I was in the minister's meeting. Not a problem at Welcome. all, sir. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Shalendra Singh. I'm uh, Jayant Krishna, the CEO of uh, UK India Business Council. Uh, welcome to the panel discussion. We have just put your address uh, towards the end uh, to manage the time better. Uh, so now you're a part of the panel being anchored by Parikshit. Thank you. Right. Uh, Mr. Singh, we have been discussing the ease of doing business report. Uh, now, according to this report, uh, there has been consistent improvement in ease of doing business in India, and this is feedback from UK businesses, and 66% of the respondents say that it's now easier to do business in India. Year after year, legal and regulatory hurdles, Mr. Singh, have been pointed out as an issue, but now there is a decline in the number of respondents quoting this as a problem as well. But uh, from the point of view of the DPIIT, uh, there has been a lot of focus on manufacturing in India. Uh, I believe you have identified 24 to 28 sectors where manufacturing can be promoted so which of, which would be the sectors where you see convergence between indian interests and uk businesses mr singh so far as sectors are concerned uh, as you all know there have been champion sectors on, on which we have been doing a lot of exercise with industry with, with our counterparts now we have some priority sectors when when we discuss with in industry of a particular country then we prepare a list of uh, products where we have our competitive advantage and you know, the other countries investors would be interested vice versa so far as uk is concerned as of now we have not done a specific exercise for investors of uk but yes when we interact with them in various fora then we of course take inputs from them and as and when required we give our inputs or whatever guidance to such investors who want to invest in a particular sector or in a particular industry hmm. right so Parikshit, if i may add uh, here uh, you know from a trade perspective the sectors you know which uh, have been identified are uh, food and drinks information and communications technology, including the IT and ITS sector, uh, healthcare and pharmaceuticals, and some other sectors like, you know, legal and professional services, uh, chemical industry, aerospace mm -hmm. and defense, you know, these, these, these are the big, uh, uh, you know, uh, bucket uh, uh, sectors. Right. Uh, Mr. Singh, we also uh, are aware that UK and India have been working out, uh, uh, working out a trade deal. They're working on uh, early harvest uh, items as well. What would be the status of those uh, negotiations, Mr. Singh, and uh, what has been the feedback from DPIIT on those talks on increasing FDI from uh, UK and also to seal that early harvest deal soon? Trade deals, I would not be able to comment because that is the Department of Commerce. Yes, yes, on increasing FDI, as Mr. Jain Krishna said, wherever we get some, uh, some uh, response or we get some uh, query then we we handhold the investor we ensure that the queries are resolved we do the joint meetings also and so that if there are any roadblocks if if they need some some consultancy we help them so that fdi there are no roadblocks and as and when the investor has taken a decision they are they able to invest in Right. And just to speak about uh, post-Brexit opportunities also for UK and their businesses, according to this report, Brexit will have no impact on uh, business with India. This is what several UK companies are saying. And I'd just like to get you in, uh, Louis, 
Uh, now, when it comes to a post-Brexit scenario, UK is looking for trade deals with several countries, including India, beneficial win-win trade deals. So how important is a partnership with India uh, among other countries in Southeast Asia? It's a great question. So from a Rolls-Royce defense perspective, India is one of our four strategic markets um, across the globe. And so the importance of a trade deal with India is paramount for the defense business. If we look across the defense environment and we look for countries that have the capability and the ambition to grow their indigenous capability, then India is certainly up there with one of the global leaders in terms of their ambition. And we think there is a real natural partnership between the UK and India in terms of the ambition that India has, the intellectual property that the UK has been developing and the talent and engineering capability that exists in India. So if I talk to you from a defence perspective, I can also talk from a broader Rolls-Royce perspective, but if I purely look at self-reliance in the defence industry, then a trade deal with India is absolutely key. And when we see self-reliance in defence, we see mm -hmm. self-reliance through partnership and collaboration. So we certainly see it as an opportunity. And post-Brexit, clearly the focus from my leadership, from a Rolls-Royce leadership, is a trade partnership with India is absolutely key. And we see that as a co-development of new technology. So this is not about selling hardware to India. I think those days are past. This is about co-developing new technology in partnership with India. So for us, certainly from a defense business unit, then India is absolutely key as a partner. And we see this as a real opportune time to make that happen. Right. Uh, Nanta, in, uh, in a post-COVID world, there are so many companies who are thinking about moving supply chains to India, moving them from China to countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Cambodia as well. What can India do to seize this moment? So, um, India, um, in, in, in my opinion, and I can talk about the sector that we uh, invest in, which is renewable energy. Uh, India has made uh, leaps and bounds in, 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 in promoting renewable energy and, and installing additional capacity. We ourselves, uh, as investors in renewable energy, were very pleasantly supply, surprised that given that uh, energy, renewable energy is a must run uh, service in India, that during the pandemic, during the COVID period, that um, uh, that our investments continue to operate. I think India has leaps and bounds in ensuring that the supply chains, not only uh, manufacturing of panels, et cetera, to counteract the imports that were coming from China, these have all increased. So I think uh, to answer your question, India just needs to concentrate on manufacturing more of these uh, um, components uh, in India, which is there, which has already been happening, and, and, and that path needs to continue. Right. Uh, Mr. Singh, could you also tell our, uh, our viewers, our guests, about some of the efforts that DPIIT might be making to make India a more attractive destination in a post-COVID world, maybe to attract more businesses from China as well? Just to take forward what Madam Nandita just said, it's not only what we propose to do, we have actually started doing a lot in the last, for the last six months. Uh, mm -hmm. We have prepared a, a list of more than 700 and 726 investors mm -hmm. across the globe who have their main bases in China. Mm -hmm. we, ha we have been interacting with them regularly and for more than 300, I mean, I don't have the exact figure, but even my secretary, myself, my team in Invest India, we are interacting with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, mm -hmm. taking, taking their inputs, making proposals mm -hmm. so that becomes attractive for them, competitive for them to shift their bases to India or even start an additional manufacturing facility. We are also mm -hmm. working with them so that they are able to, once they start manufacturing here, where mm -hmm. all can they import? So that mm. their such countries' dependence on China is reduced. So mm. then, we are, then we are product-wise, not sector-wise, mm. actually product-wise, we are mm. preparing an incentive scheme. Mm. Both then we are uh, looking at both tariff and non-tariff measures, so mm. that 
is it becomes even more competitive to start manufacturing in india and the, mm -hmm. all that work going on and i can see results very positive results from around 80 companies last week i reviewed with 80 mm -hmm. companies i see very positive results and i am confident that they will you know, very soon uh, come to india or expand i there are a few of them which are already in a, in a small way in india they, they are present mm -hmm. here and they will expand big way besides right. specific for such companies who are manufacturing in china but besides that on the ease mm -hmm. of doing business we have been looking at uk ibcs before mm -hmm. and we have been taking the uh, from from that report we are taking it up with the states with other ministries mm -hmm. to take for the suggestions which you receive to make mm -hmm. india generally and most of the states business becomes easier for such companies right you know mr singh uh, when you're saying that uh, india is trying to make it easier for companies uh, making the ecosystem even better and of course uh, the aim might be in the right direction that we want to localize more and that's why we are seeing quality control orders maybe also to check dumping in the country but these have been seen with uh, with a with a fair bit of concern by some companies saying that some of the low volume players may be affected by uh, uh, by these quality control orders because there is not just uh, they don't have that kind of capacity or they don't have that kind of scale or technology or the market available uh, for uh, for for those kind of goods in india and that's why it's important to import them so how would you address those concerns on quality control orders some of them which we've seen post the pandemic whenever a quality control order is issued we do detailed stakeholder consultations many rounds of stakeholder consultations and only when we are confident that our manufacturing capabilities our testing capabilities everything mm. is in place only then with such orders are issued and mm. when we find that they may take some time to equip themselves then we defer mm -hmm. the order and make it applicable maybe from a year from now two years from now so if right. there are still issues we have, we have an open mind we can review such orders right uh, mr krishna would you uh, like to recommend certain uh, uh, reforms or some changes to recent quality control orders that may have been made uh, in the last uh, couple of months over here Yes, Mr. Krishna. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes Please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think I think uh, some of some of the reforms uh, that you know uh, we have uh, looked at, uh, as I as I said earlier, you know some of the uh, pharma sector uh, pricing regulation reforms that we, we have taken it up with the the Department of Pharmaceuticals. You know we have taken up with the Ministry of Human Resource Development this new education policy which has come up. Uh, it allows. Uh, to, uh, 100 uh, global top uh, universities to set up campuses in India, and 20 of them are uh, happen to be uh, UK universities. So you know we, mm -hmm. we have talked about you know how the how uh, the regulation uh, that the government of India enacts has to be more uh, fair and uh, equitable. Uh, we have talked about you know that you you should not just look at the top 100 universities uh, the overall ranking, but you should pick up sectors which are very very strategic uh, to India. For example, healthcare could be one. Uh, uh, behavioral science could be something else. I'm just giving some examples. So you should focus the ranking of universities in those sectors which are critical to India and then invite those universities and not just the overall uh, global uh, top 100 universities. Uh, and also, you know, there's a mutual recognition of degrees issue. You know, still uh, India and UK do not have this treaty for mutual recognition of degrees, which has been pending for quite a lot time, a long time. We have had some discussions with MHRD. Uh, and, and they have said that now it should be simpler because because the new education policy is focusing on the learning outcomes rather than the learning duration, which used to become a big hurdle in in in, in a treaty of this kind happening between UK and and, and India. So I think there there are various sectors. You know, uh, we are talking about some uh, fintech uh, alliance uh, uh, happening so that there is a greater collaboration electronically of uh, uh, financial services uh, companies. Uh, you know, so whole whole lot of reforms, you know, which are uh, uh, which are which are some of some of the rules which have been uh, imposed uh, on on foreign banks, which are not applicable to the Indian banks. 
you know, it makes the, the playing field not as uh, level uh, for them. So we have taken it up uh, with, with, with the right uh, authorities and regulators in India that, you know, that, that needs to change. So, I mean, this is every, every month, you know, there are at least uh, uh, two, three major reform baskets that we, we, we analyze uh, with our uh, members, with the British industry and take up with different, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, departments and ministries and government of India, including, uh, you know, uh, DPIIT, including Niti IO, or whosoever is the right uh, anchor for that reform, Parikshit. So uh, that's uh, that's interesting to know uh, and good to see that Mr. Singh and the DPIIT are so receptive to so those suggestions as well. Uh, Louis, if I can come to you, now this report points out some of the reform priorities uh, that the Indian government should have. Improving bureaucratic processes is one, availability of finance and credit, increasing regulatory certainty, quality of infrastructure, education and skill sector reforms as well. But from your point of view, from the point of view of Rolls-Royce, which are the kind of reforms that you would see in India if it has to become a leader when it comes to defence manufacturing? I think the reforms in India for defence manufacturing uh, need to happen both in the UK and in India. So I think the reforms are what we've talked about. The regulatory environment needs to be stable. Um, as we commented previously, these are long cycle programs and businesses have to invest for the long term. If we're talking about developing jet engine technology, which is where we're focusing in Rolls-Royce to do that in collaboration with India, well, actually, we're looking at a development program six to 10 years, mm -hmm. and we need mm -hmm. a stable environment in which to operate. Now, from a defense perspective, I really do believe the key is government to government relations. Uh, and there mm. I would say that the UK has some way to go. We see mm. clearly some other nations that have much stronger government to government relations. And we're mm -hmm. working with our own government, the UK government, to make sure that that is now a focus in a post-Brexit world. Let's be mm. really honest, the UK government has perhaps been somewhat distracted of recent years. And I think mm -hmm. now post-Brexit, it gives an opportunity for those government-to-government -government relations to happen. So just to mm -hmm. share a statistic, around 70% of defence deals happen on a government-to-government -government basis with India. And that's where I think reforms both from the UK and the Indian side need to improve to give us that environment in which to compete with other nations. Because there is a uniqueness to what the UK can bring to India in terms of technology development. We need mm -hmm. in the UK to be willing to let go, to develop mm -hmm. intellectual property jointly, to have that intellectual property be owned, co-owned with India. And mm -hmm. to do that is going to take reforms on both sides. So I take your question very well, but I think actually, again, it's back to collaboration and having some truly synergetic reforms that say mm -hmm. the UK can let go. The partnership mm -hmm. can happen for the greater benefit of both nations in a stable environment for a decade or more to come. A big ask, I know, um, but that would be my answer from a defence perspective. Right, and also because uh, when it comes to defence goods, the government is the biggest buyer. Yes. Uh, Nanta, if I can uh, get you in, this report has also spoken about barriers to businesses. From your point of view, which are some of the barriers that need to be addressed immediately by the Indian government? Um, the main barriers is, are, are pretty similar to the ones pointed out in, in the report um, from, a, from a perspective that of, way of our investment in the renewable energy sector. Um, regulatory environment needs to be stable. And the other big um, topic, which I think is across sectors, is the taxation uh, environment also needs to be um, more certain and more stable. So um, for uh, fulfilling the capacity that's required in the country for renewable energy, um, there has to be some amount of imports of panels, etc. So the uh, environment around um, import duties and tariffs need to be more uh, relevant and stable. So, so um, as Mr. Krishna had said earlier, people invest for the longer term. This is not a short-term investment. We're talking, especially in the energy sector, 20, 25-year investment. Uh, and um, yes, you you expect um, uh, certain amounts of rules and regulations to be modified over the years, but uh, but uh, big changes um, need to be known on the outset. Right. Mr. Krishna, we're uh, now getting a, a question from our audience as well, and this is on the Data Protection Bill. Uh, 
are there concerns about uh, the contours of this bill and how would it change the way uk companies do businesses in india yeah uh, so data protection uh, continues to be an area uh, which is which is very very important and not just uh, the personal data even the non personal data so the, you know the, we have submitted uh, our recommendations on that front to the ministry of uh, information technology government of india and uh, we are taking it up some of the some of the broad things that i can talk about you know some of the definitions in the in the proposed bill uh, you know they need lot of clarification we are even talking about see government of india perhaps is talking about uh, two different regulators for the personal data and the non personal data you know our recommendation has been don't complicate things to that extent because otherwise there will be multiplicity of regulators and 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 quite often one regulator would not know where, know where the bound its boundary has ended and the second regulator's boundary has, uh, has uh, started so you know we are talking mm -hmm. about one layer of regulation uh, and and there are several other uh, you know uh, data uh, uh, related uh, asks you know that british industry has uh, packaged and we have taken it up with the government of india with the ministry of information technology we are also Mr. talking Singh, about data data adequacy agreement and and things like that yes so this is thing i know this may not directly uh, concern you but data protection data privacy now these are the big things for uh, companies this has been an issue with the with the us government as well uk businesses are also raising their concerns uh, how would you assure investors about this how are you trying to address those concerns in uk has a data protection law many other countries have such laws and mm. wherever there is a regulation companies will have issues it's not that all other law countries laws they don't have issues so it's mm. just a bit and whoever will have an issue will flag it and then mm. at the appropriate authority in this case the ministry and the parliament will take a call mm. and law is always evolving if there is a law even if it takes the shape of a law bill still if there mm. are issues it can always be taken care of uh, mm. over time so it's not mm. that uh, that should not be a law because without a law you know how can mm. you protect the data of important data of the country of citizens how to give them privacy so mm. that is important right you know uh, just to also speak to you uh, mrs singh about the ease of doing business index every year the dpiit comes out with a report on how different states are performing when it comes to ease of doing business interestingly for the third year running this report says uh, the ease of doing business report of the uk ibc that maharashtra is the number one state when it comes to making progress in the ease of doing business then you've got karnataka delhi gujarat tamil nadu uh, so where do you think some of the issues lie with states when it comes to ease of doing business uh, do you feel there are certain areas where they need to be more receptive to concerns of foreign uh, foreign governments and foreign companies so when we talk of ease of doing business our model is sector agnostic this country agnostic it is it's a general principle of giving ease for businesses to start businesses for businesses to run businesses to exit end to end so it, it doesn't discriminate between any country or any sector so when we say that a particular country that num it is a particular state is at on number 10th rank this is mm -hmm. on specific parameters we we have a list of action points where they have to fare well and if they do mm -hmm. well they be mm -hmm. they are on the top if they don't they are not there so mm -hmm. but yes what you are saying is of facilitation mm -hmm. if there are any issue of a foreign of a foreign company or mm -hmm. they need some hand holding or facilitation that's a different mm -hmm. matter that mm -hmm. states do proactively and we also mm -hmm. help the states and the companies and hold them give them the required support but ease of mm -hmm. doing business is a separate thing where mm -hmm. we see the processes how simple they are the cost on doing business how costly they are how much time does it take to get an approval or a clearance how how is it to file returns pay tax mm -hmm. all that so all that is right. very specific and so on those specific parameters we rank the states right uh, uh, interesting and i would also like to ask you about uh, brexit uh, mr singh you know according to this report majority of the respondents say that there will be no impact on ties between uk and indian companies uh, 31% of the respondents say that it has 
caused their companies, their firms to plan more businesses with India. Uh, we have been reading a lot of reports about DPIITs and India's engagement with the United States. But when it comes to UK companies, how many UK companies would you have identified uh, for attracting investments into India? I'll have to check uh, how many companies are there. I, I can't give this reply offhand. But I'll, I'll find out and I'll maybe I'll come back to you on how many UK companies are there in the list. But we have targeted such companies who have their base in China. But so far as okay. Brexit is concerned, I don't see any, any problem post Brexit of any diminishing relationship with US, US UK companies or whatever. I think it will be a business as usual and uh, whether they are the post Brexit scenario, if they are doing in business in India, whether it is mm -hmm. post Brexit, Brexit, whatever, you would like mm -hmm. them to uh, be able to do business without any uh, un unnecessary burden. Right. You know, uh, Mr. Krishna, I think we can ask you that as well, like, you know, in a, a post-Brexit scenario, in a post-pandemic scenario, how many such companies have uh, shown interest in moving supply chains from China to India or maybe set up shop in India? See, uh, you know, what, what is happening right now, uh, Parikshit, is a mere exploration, you know, uh, because uh, there, is, there, is, there is a cost of uh, having a supply chain and, and uh, unwinding it and trying different locations is not that seamless, not that easy. And let me, for avoidance of doubt, let me also uh, see companies, uh, after companies, if they, they were laying all eggs in one in the Chinese basket, there were reasons, you know, because, because of uh, uh, China's economy of scale, you know, they being a large volume player, they themselves having the largest uh, uh, market size in terms of local population, and, 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 and a huge amount of productivity that, you know, they were able to bring uh, onto the table, you know. So, so I think uh, people have started exploring exploration because of what we have seen during the pandemic and also because of some geopolitical reasons. Uh, I, I would not be able to share the names of the companies because they are still at the exploration stage. We are also helping some of them uh, to, to, to figure out, uh, you know, what, what those possibilities are. But as far as our current, uh, current uh, British uh, or UK businesses in India, you know, there are some very, very uh, uh, big names, you know, I mean, uh, you, you have uh, Kane, you have HSBC, you have Stanchart, you have Vodafone, JCB. JCB, for example, it, it, it uh, uh, undertakes a very substantive part of their global manufacturing in India, you know. Uh, 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 if, if I'm not mistaken, al almost more than half of it. Glaxo, you, you know, the serum institutes uh, uh, trying with the AstraZeneca, uh, the, the Oxford uh, vaccine, Rolls-Royce, Diageo, British Petroleum. So, you know, the footprint is, is huge. Uh, so there are, I mean, when you talk about reforms, you know, reform is, reform is not one bus that you board and go on. It's, a, it's an ongoing journey, you know, I mean, uh, and it, it has to keep happening incrementally. And if you, if you look at, uh, see today, uh, British, uh, the UK businesses in India, you know, they are the second fastest growing G20 country in India in terms of investments, you know. And, and, and this is not the data of one year, you know, which can give you a misleading uh, picture. This is the data for mm -hmm. last 10 years taken in a row. The UK, UK is, is, is the companies are actually the, the second fastest uh, growing among the G20 countries, which are which are the biggest countries in the world. Uh, so I think uh, if, if you look at the trade relationship, you know, we had uh, a business of almost 24 uh, billion uh, pounds uh, last year, and it showed a growth of 10 percent, which was higher mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, the, the, the economy's growth rate, the GDP growth rate, uh, which either of the two countries had. So I think I think uh, things are changing. And if you look at the reverse, you know, gear. Uh, you know, India today is the second largest inv investor in India, in, in sorry, in UK, the Indian companies. So I think I think it's a it's a lot lot has been happening, and we are not uh, starting from a, a zero base or a, from a small base. There is big critical mass already. If you look at the entire FDI of all UK companies into India, in the last ten years itself, the, the order of magnitude has been about twenty two uh, billion uh, 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 you know pounds sterling. You know. So it's a it's a huge amount. Uh, there's already a critical mass, and it's improving. And uh, and and what uh, some positivity that survey uh, shows, and also along with some caution in terms of some barriers that we need to look upon, some reforms that we need to um, uh, you know enact in India. I think if that happens, uh, you know, I I, I see uh, no reason you know why things will not happen. Even if on the trade front, you know, we have the enhanced uh, trade partnership uh, 
you know, which which uh, in the last JETCO in July, the two countries agreed to both mm -hmm. uh, Liz uh, Taylor and Mr. Piyush Goyal, uh, they agreed. And and again, you know, the meeting is happening on 9th of uh, 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 November. And, and and eventually the idea is to lead this into, into a, uh, uh, you know, a FTA, into a free trade agreement, you know. So I think things are, uh, 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 I mean, everything is hunky-dory. Perhaps my answer would be uh, no. But uh, but there's a great amount of cautious optimism of the British business in engaging with India and, and increasing uh, their business footprint uh, into the country. That's what I feel, Parikshit. I, 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 I see a lot of hope, but uh, it does not mean that, you know, every all issues or barriers we have sorted out or government of India has sorted out. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a progressive journey. I, I see uh, right. government of India of late being more receptive to ideas, uh, to reforms, you know, and, and I, you know, we see some hunger in government of India now, which was not there previously. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a good story, Parikshit. All right. I think we've completely run out of time on this discussion. I'm going to hand it back to Mr. Krishna, but uh, Louis Donahue, Nandita Sagar, Mr. Sharendra Singh, Jayant Krishna, thank you very much for joining us and talking about the ease of doing business and what the two countries can do better in the years to come. Thank you so much. Back to you, Mr. Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Parikshit. Uh, you know, and, and since we missed out uh, uh, to you, Mr. Sharendra uh, Singh, of course, some of the thoughts uh, became clear as uh, Parikshit was asking questions. Uh, but, you know, we would like you to address uh, and especially your role as the additional secretary in DPIIT. Uh, you know, uh, I, I believe, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, improving the ease of doing business of India as a country is, is an integral part of it. And, and we have seen over a period of time how uh, India uh, uh, has shown a tremendous progress in terms of its uh, rank, uh, which was 141, 142, 143, around that level to 63 last year. And, and, you know, uh, the aspiration of UKIBC is that very soon this rank should be in the top 50 nations. And, and perhaps for a country of our size, and uh, we, we are already, both uh, UK and India, you know, we have our size of our GDP is of a comparable level. You know, both, us, both of us are, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, India is today the fifth largest economy in the world and uh, very, very uh, close to uh, UK. And, and uh, so I think it's, uh, we would like to more uh, hear more about the government story uh, as to how you know our aspiration of uh, becoming in the top 50 uh, ease of doing uh, business nations uh, uh, as early as possible and and within foreseeable future perhaps in the top 25 you know what what's the what's the what's the roadmap uh, that government of india has mr shalin singh because i understand you have done personally uh, along with your team a lot of work in that space so over to you mr singh no, believe me i have a roadmap to come to top 10 so, okay. so, so that will be that very very difficult because certain parameters the developing countries don't stand a chance because this assessment of the world bank is tilted in favor of developed countries and specifically when we we, we, we for example in for trading across borders eu <coughs> there are no borders within eu but still india is compared with eu countries for trading across borders Similarly, there are very various other parameters and where a developing country is at a disadvantage, particularly with such a, with such countries where, where they are in a in a block. So, but still, we we have a roadmap. Uh, it's it's a matter of time uh, and effort required. Uh, but I'm sure if the government is continues to be proactive as it is as of now. We will surely reach, reach that rank. And let me tell you, we are, we are not limited ourselves to Mumbai and Delhi, which are being assessed by the World Bank. We have taken on the day one, day the first year when I joined DPIT, I took it to the whole country. And we are the only country in the world where we are doing, with the help of World Bank, we are doing a sub-national exercise of ease of doing business if the world bank does it with some other countries but it's just a ranking exercise but what we do is we are reforming the for each and every state we are not just doing ranking we are reforming so we are hand holding them guiding them getting uh, things done talking to industry taking feedback giving them back the feedback asking them to improve all that we are doing which is which is the, and so we are the only country doing it but though we take pride, I know it's, it's a long journey, as uh, you said, Mr. Krishna, and with your 
help and your guidance will take it forward. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, very heartening to know that. And, uh, you know, UKIBC would like to act as a partner in progress uh, because uh, both these countries, you know, uh, have a, a shared history. We have shared set of values. We are uh, among the world's biggest uh, democracies, uh, you know, and, 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 and I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, you could, you could uh, bank on us for a very, very independent and fair assessment as to what are the key reforms which uh, India should be uh, working upon, and uh, we also we have also seen in the last few months actually how government of India has seen pandemic as a uh, you know its its constraints and problems notwithstanding how government of India has leveraged the pandemic as an opportunity to to uh, enact reforms you know a uh, lot of reforms for the MSME sectors you know which will all lead to more liquidity with the with with the banks and uh, NBFC sector and uh, and and also with the uh, you know, in terms of credit guarantees and things like that, the recent uh, agriculture, uh, Mundi related reforms, you know, which will which will uh, bring uh, uh, much more corporate play into the into the into the agriculture uh, uh, system and uh, perhaps would lead to enhanced uh, incomes uh, uh, of farmers. So I think these are uh, uh, these are very, very encouraging that how government of India has looked upon this uh, pandemic, uh, you know, not just as a setback but as, a, as an opportunity to reform. I'm also aware of some of the labor reforms which have been done at the federal level and also by some state governments uh, at least. So I think these are very uh, encouraging uh, symptoms, uh, but you know, and we hope uh, that you know, the seriousness about reforms you know, would, would continue even in the post pandemic uh, with, with a renewed uh, zeal, uh, vigor and enthusiasm, uh, Mr. Singh. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions uh, from uh, any of uh, our participants, uh, you know, that we could take up? If there are any, Mr. Krishna, can you take those questions because I have another meeting, I'm already late. All right. Can I leave? All right. No. no, we are, we are, we are anyway closing, Mr. Singh. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Singh, for your time and, uh, you know, we'll come and meet you in your office. Uh, uh, we have done it with the uh, other functionaries in your uh, ministry and we'll do it with you. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have this shared vision of uh, making India great and, uh, you know, doing more co-creation, co-development with UK businesses, uh, using their technology, using their research and development, using their innovation for manufacturing in India and take the Prime Minister's uh, Atmanidwar Bharat ambition uh, further. I don't know what level you joined, but our survey clearly show, shows that uh, 69 or 70 percent of uh, of all respondents see this. Sorry, uh, more than that. I think uh, uh, six, uh, almost close 77 percent. 77 percent of the businesses who were surveyed, they feel it's an opportunity for them to engage more with India and do more business with India. So, uh, and 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 uh, if anything, it means uh, a greater uh, uh, you know integration of the Indian business uh, with the global economy and and not isolation at all. So the earlier, uh, you know, apprehensions about uh, protectionism have all uh, have started melting away and, and uh, British businesses are seeing more and more opportunity. And, uh, you know, we wish you all the best uh, in your journey. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take on the promise uh, or, or aspiration, even though it may be a stretched goal to uh, take India, uh, not just to the top 25, but perhaps make an effort, serious effort to take it to the top uh, uh, 10 list. I think, I think uh, that would be the wonderful thing and, and a real uh, opportunity for India. And, uh, and it will really help India, uh, you know, actualize its dream of becoming, you know, the global, uh, you know, uh, 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 workhouse and global uh, workshop, actually. Uh, the workshop of the world ambition of India would, would, would get uh, realized, uh, Mr. Singh. So thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you, uh, Louis and Nandita. We really appreciate... Uh, you know, you taking time off and, and sharing your pearls of wisdom, your experiences of your respective uh, companies and all beyond, even beyond. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, both your companies are very, very important and key partners uh, uh, for uh, uh, UK India uh, growth story. And, uh, and and really appreciate and, you know, we'll, we'll keep engaging and, uh, you know, keep uh, uh, the bilateral uh, economic ties, uh, you know, between these two countries to a new height. Uh, thank you for all the participants for uh, coming in and our report on ease of doing business 
uh, has been uh, uh, posted on our website, which is www.ukibc.com. Uh, uh, please have a look uh, and, and give us uh, some suggestions, what your thoughts are, where you conquer, where you do not uh, conquer, and also give us uh, you know, how we could uh, make this report even more value adding in, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we really appreciate you uh, coming on board uh, uh, at, at, at this uh, webinar. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Luis. And thank you, all the participants. And a big thanks to the uh, the entire UKIBC team, which has worked uh, painstakingly almost on a 24 by 7 basis for the last uh, you know uh, few days uh, to make this report happen, given the final uh, give it the final shape, which was actually re actually released by the British uh, by the UK Minister for Investment, Lord uh, Grimstone, uh, at at a roundtable just before this uh, uh, session. So thank you very much, uh, and you know uh, uh, I, I really appreciate your time, and thank you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and connecting with you at the next opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Louise, and thank you all, all, all the uh, participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all the panelists and that audience. Thanks.